Welcome uh, to the sixth edition of the Border, uh, Border Regions Beyond Borders Breakfast Debates. Uh, I am Andrew Lansley. I'm the uh, Strategic Council at uh, Lowe Associates, and we are very privileged and glad to be able to support DG Regio uh, and their work in the uh, Cross Border Regions um, uh, Corporation. This, uh, this, the sixth, uh, I've really enjoyed uh, the, the breakfast debates very much indeed, and I'm very much looking forward to this one. Thank you to all of you who are presently joining us uh, and sending greetings from right across Europe. And we're going to take this opportunity to, uh, uh, in 2022, which is the European Year of Youth, uh, to be seeing how young people's uh, activities and participation in civic life uh, and uh, cooperation between regions can be an essential part of the uh, inter-regional cooperation. So um, we're going to, uh, the structure today is I'm going to ask Louise Floman from DG Regio, the programme manager there, to make an introduction, uh, after which we will hear about uh, the youth manifesto from Vexa. I'll introduce Vexa in a few moments. We will then go to two interesting case studies followed by a panel discussion, a whole group of really well-placed um, participants able to tell us about the, both the experience of cross-border cooperation involving young people, but also put it in a broader context. So, um, uh, but we have two polls as well. We want a bit of uh, immediate participation from you, uh, our esteemed audience. Um, two polls, the first of which, you can, I hope, see on your screen. Uh, and what we're uh, asking here uh, is for two answers. So we'll get a sense, so you have two opportunities to choose from amongst these options of those things that might best improve involvement of young citizens in cross-border collaboration. So we have the awareness of the uh, IB volunteer programme, we have curriculum in schools about cross-border cooperation. We have relationships cross borders through exchanges and twinning programs. We have the cross-border public transport system option, cross-border cooperation on social media and events, and the inclusion of young people's organizations in program monitoring committees through interface programs. So six options. If you'd be kind enough to uh, vote on those after we've heard from Bexa, uh, I will tell you the results of that poll and launch your second poll. So participation throughout. When we get to the uh, panel, uh, I will be drawing upon the questions that you have been putting onto the Q&A. Um, you will find, I hope you don't find it at all um, confusing. If you want to ask a question of the panel, do please put it on the Q&A and I will try and pick them all up from there if I can. If you want to send a, perhaps a, a link or a bit of information to your colleagues, please use the chat. So that would be very helpful to distinguish between those. Chat is, as you can imagine, a conversation between all our participants. Q&A is an opportunity to put questions to our speakers. So let me begin uh, in welcoming uh, very much Louise Floman, who is uh, the Programme Manager at DG Regio. And we very much look forward to Louise giving us the context and introducing our discussion this morning. Louise, please. Thank you so much, Andrew, and good morning, everyone, and welcome for me as well. Uh, as you said already, my name is Louise Fluman, and I work for DD Regio uh, in the cross border unit. Uh, and apart from working with uh, interreg programs, I'm also responsible for issues relating to youth and education, and also for the interreg volunteer youth initiative. Uh, we are now in the European Year of Youth, uh, which is, in my opinion, a very well chosen priority, uh, since we know that youth has been uh, affected, especially by the pandemic. Uh, we know also that youth is uh, passionate about um, very uh, important issues such as the green transition and that they can contribute with their enthusiasm and fresh and innovative mind. Uh, in the interreg world, we have focused on youth already since some time. So we welcome very much the European Year of Youth as an occasion to take stock on what has already been done, but also how to uh, look into the future and how to kick off youth engagement in the new uh, interreg programs. 
so what we are working on on our side is first of all the Interreg Volunteer Youth Initiative, which is up and running since 2017, where young people can engage in Interreg projects or as Interreg reporters in the program. Uh, since 2017, over 700 young volunteers have been taking part in this initiative. We will later hear actually from a volunteer talking about a little bit about their experience in the Interreg Volunteer Youth. Um, and, and furthermore, during the celebration of Interreg 30 years in 2020, uh, youth was one of our priority areas. Um, so at the time we decided that we wanted to go beyond this regular you know, campaign, focusing a little bit on youth projects, but actually actively involving the youth in the process. Um, so we started up a process together with our colleagues in the unit for transnational cooperation and macro regional strategies, where we involved uh, young people who have some sort of experience of interreg, whether they have been a volunteer or involved in a project or, or similar. Um, and um, we invited them to take part in an on online consultation uh, and a series of workshops. Uh, and we tried, the aim was to try, take stock of what young people are expecting from interreg. Uh, and all this uh, resulted in a youth manifesto for young people by young people, um, which lines out what kind of policy areas that the youth prioritize. Uh, and secondly, also recommendations from the young people to the interreg programs and to the commission. Um, and this manifesto was presented at the celebration of interreg 30 years in 2020. Um, and the areas that youth care most about are generally um, education, employment, and of course, climate and environment, which are very close to their heart. Um, and from the recommendations, the most important that we take away from this, these recommendations in the manifesto is that the young people want to be actively involved in Interreg, not just as a target group for projects, but also in the design of projects and priorities, and even in the selection of projects. Uh, and here we need your help. We are dependent on you, both from the programs to allow for the youth to engage and also uh, from the youth to actually engage. Um, and we have continued to work on this since 2020 um, together with a core group of youth that meets regularly. And of course our work gets uh, very much boosted with the European ER Youth. Uh, we are launching now um, our own campaign related to this, uh, which will be called uh, Youth for Cooperation. You see the hashtag up here. Uh, we have created this hashtag and also this um, logo or stamp. Uh, many thanks to the colleagues and in Interact for helping us with this. Uh, and we hope that you will be able to use this in the communication, all communication related to youth uh, during this year. Um, yeah, and that we will have a number of events related to this. And this is the first kickoff event and also the first time that we're using this very brand new logo. Um, and, and we, it's a sort of a stamp that we want to put on all the interreg projects or events taking place to, during the European Year of Youth. Um, and yes, and we really, we really rely on you using this. Uh, it will be available in the coming days on Interact's webpage and also uh, on our own webpage, InfoRegio. Uh, and now in this session, we will hear voices from uh, young people involved in different initiatives and also from projects with innovative ways to involve youth in different ways. So uh, from my side, I'm very excited to hear uh, these ideas and good practice that we have around in the regions already. And I hope that they can serve as an inspiration for you who want to uh, do more to involve youth. So uh, thank you. And uh, I'm looking forward to this session. Louise, thank you very much indeed. And thanks for that introduction. That's really uh, interesting. Um, we've, I can see that there's been some uncertainty and difficulty in getting two responses on the poll for some people. Don't worry about that. If you can get one answer in, put one answer in, we'll get the overall shape of uh, what people's responses are. Uh, and I will report on the first poll after we've had an opportunity to hear from Bekta. I'm looking forward, Bekta. Bekta Gilligel uh, is um, from the, is a co-author of the Youth Manifesto, the 2020s Manifesto for Young People by Young People to shape the European cooperation policy. So we're looking forward very much to hearing about the manifesto. Please, over to you, Betsa. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, so as Andrew said, I am part of the manifesto core group. Uh, I had uh, the opportunity to join in the group uh, at the beginning, my own IV as an IV reporter. 
and uh, it's been a bit over a year now. And uh, last year during the Interreg annual event, uh, we celebrated the one year launch of this manifesto. And we had the opportunity uh, as uh, with some Ivies and so, some other young members of the manifesto group to present our views, our recommendation to the Interreg programs. And uh, as Louise mentioned, we do regularly uh, meet usually on a monthly basis to, to review the, uh, the new steps that we're taking. Uh, our goal right now is to implement further this manifesto, to advocate to the Interact programs project, but also to the broader stakeholders and institutions to do follow the steps that we recommend, steps that have been announced by young people. This is their wishes. And also, this is a transition period for interact programs. So now is actually the perfect moment to involve youth in the new objectives for the new programmation and also to integrate them in their teams to cooperate, transporter, also transgeneration. And uh, as part of this group, uh, a few of us, uh, even smaller group, uh, we are currently working on launching the first Interact Youth Summit uh, in May. And this summit has for a goal to bring awareness about this manifesto, but also to empower young people to get involved in uh, the Interact programs and to be able to apply for projects or to also orient these projects towards youth challenges in the borders areas. And uh, we will collaborate also with the EUSR program on that. And uh, after this conference, this youth conference, we wish to continue the initiative and to bring more awareness and more opportunities for young people to have a voice and have an active role in this decision that will impact their future. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and uh, we're going to open it out uh, um, in a moment by hearing uh, two case studies, um, literally those who've been working uh, across the uh, borders. Um, but first, let's have an opportunity just to look at, um, you've been working away at trying to get two answers in, but if you've only got one, no matter. Um, let's have a look at the poll and see what people's relative um, importance is in improving involvement of young citizens. So building relationships by promoting the cross-border um, activity, that uh, uh, cross-borders, yes, uh, is cross-border exchanges between schools and universities. That's the, that's the top one, the, the, the exchanges uh, clearly comes top. Next, uh, implementing a curriculum in schools. So again, in the schools context, uh, it's been very important. I've lost the poll off my screen, uh, but, I, but the other uh, uh, elements all got some support, but it's quite interesting to see the, um, the cross-border exchanges and city twinning programs was the most favored poll element. Let's, uh, let's start, let's, um, uh, let's initiate the second poll because we can, we'll then have the results of this in time to feed it into the panel discussion after our case studies. So let's have a look at this. This is definitely one answer, please. Uh, in your opinion, how can cross-border projects encourage young people to help them in their mission? Addressing issues that are most important to young people, such as climate change, boosting employment or access to training and educational opportunities across borders, communicating better about what they do for their regions, or facilitating a dialogue between young people and local and national EU uh, institutions and authorities. So we've got four quite separate uh, potential answers there, if you would please choose one of those in a moment. Uh, meanwhile, let's take the opportunity to hear from those who've been involved directly, starting with Maria Rosaria Valentini, who is communication officer uh, for the uh, Interreg France Italy Alcotra uh, programme since 2016. Uh, and based as the joint in the joint secretariat of the program in Turin. So, Maria Rosario, Hello. will you tell us please about uh, our yeah. culture? Hello to everyone. Uh, let's try to share my screen.
Do you see? Yep, yep, yep. Thank okay. you, Maria Rosario. Okay. That's great. Good. Great. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting uh, the Alcotra program uh, to participate uh, to this uh, breakfast debate. I have the, the pleasure uh, uh, to representing it as communication officer, as well as a mentor of nine interreg reporters in the framework of the interreg volunteer youth initiative. I'm based in Turin, as you said, at the Joint Secretariat but the managing authority of the program is the Auvergne rhône alpes region based in Lyon, in France. Uh, what is Alcatra? Let's go through our the presentation. Alcatra is an acronym, Alpe Latin uh, Cooperation Transfrontalière, is one of the European cross-border cooperation programs. As uh, you can see on the map, it covers uh, the Alpine territory between uh, France and Italy. Alcatra aims to improve the people's quality of life through a, a cross-border cooperation touching the economy, the environment, and the services to the citizens. Uh, Alcatra has always uh, uh, supported youth and integrated the young perspective into its team. Ample space uh, has um, been given to young people during the 1420 program period, and we expect to do more in the 2127 period. What did we do? Uh, we have uh, given more space uh, uh, to young people in the, uh, in the Alcotra area uh, throughout our beneficiaries, uh, our project. The teams of the program which most affect young people such as education, environment, culture, have been given a priority. We have uh, uh, created several links with other programs, in particular with the EU ALP, uh, the EU strategy for the Alpine region. We have invited, for example, the EU ALP ambassador for the French presidency, Nicolas Plan, uh, to speak to young people about the environment. We have highlighted a lot the Interreg Volunteer Youth Initiative and promoted it among the Alcotra project uh, so that they have been able to host several Interreg project partners. Um, as you can see, here, just an overview of uh, all uh, the IV that we hosted. Um, uh, and we have um, challenged our communication to raise awareness of the program among young people and involve the youth in Alcoltra actions, making them participant and players of several annual events of the program. For example, uh, in uh, uh, 217, 200 young people participated in our event. Um, uh, we have shaped as well uh, for them some special, special edition competition. As uh, the last year uh, storytelling contest, we invited the local young people from 10 to 26 to speak out throughout on, um, stories on climate change that affect the Alcotra area. Uh, and um, the winners have been awarded with the paragliding uh, workshop. Uh, what we will do uh, for the next program period? We have already involved the youth in the preparation of the program period 21-27 as a director of the Tomorrow Cross-Border Cooperation. Uh, we have involved them throughout a consultation, uh, online consultation. The program tried to understand the perception that the younger people have over the cross-border area and their expectation for the period 21-27. Uh, the managing authority shall propose uh, as well to establish an Alcotra Youth Council. This uh, Youth Council uh, will provide the monitoring uh, committee with the point of view, the, the point of view, sorry, uh, of young people on the program. 
uh, we uh, we will create a network of all of the IVs uh, in uh, the Alcotra territory and include at least one IV representative on the Youth Council of the program. Uh, and the last proposal for uh, the next period is to give uh, more space to young people in the Alcotra area throughout our project. Uh, in particular, the novelty of the new program period of, uh, for Alcotra are the micro project, a smaller scale cooperation project. Uh, and the idea is to plan a micro project for a young audience. That's it for us. Super, thank you very much, Maria Rosario. That's, uh, I mean, there's some wonderful ideas there. Um, uh, I'm hoping, uh, I'm sure we'll be able to, uh, subsequently to be able to put presentations uh, on the um, Focal Point Network website so that people can see them because uh, I'm sure lots of people will, will be very interested to see some of those ideas and, and have the opportunity perhaps to um, follow up and use them themselves so thank you very much indeed for that. The, um, You're welcome, thank you. So thank you for that. Um, our, our second presentation uh, is um, is from, let me just be sure that I put it, yeah, it is from Zvetelina Genova, yes, uh, on behalf of the Robius project. And uh, I know Zvetelina will give us um, uh, details of where that is and what it involves. Thank you very much. Your chairperson of the International Management Institute in Bulgaria and head of project and applied research at Varna University of Management. So. Vetalina, you're very welcome. Thank you. Tell us, please, about the Robius project. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Good morning, everyone. I'm really pleased to be part of this event, and I'm looking forward to our results. I will share my screen as well uh, to show where we are and uh, what we did. Is it, is it seen now? Yes, thank you. It's there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you're able yes. to, I don't know if you're able maybe to get it to full screen. Yes, this is what I'm uh, doing. Okay, uh, okay, let's try like this. Okay, it is it. So yeah, perfect. Uh, uh, the chat. So we are based right here at the Black Sea coast in Varna. Uh, this is the seat of the International Management Institute, which uh, initiated and. Uh, managed to realize this uh, project also with the support with the DG Regio. It is a small initiative, but uh, very targeted to our region. Uh, in our membership, uh, we have a lot of young people uh, from the higher education area, so a lot of students. And we are also pleased that uh, some of our members are actually young members of the local authorities of the municipal councils. So we are working very targetly to make this liaison between young people uh, when acting as uh, youth activists, but also when moving to the authorities and uh, already in the position of decision maker, it's because we think that this is very, very important for actually making the role of, role of youth uh, in, in civic and in public uh, life really efficient. Uh, but about our region and it's about our project, it is called Robulas, so it comes from Romania, Bulgaria and us, because cohesion means holding together. And we developed some tools for enhancing youth engagement in the Romania, Bulgaria cross-border cooperation, so we are very targeted. This is where we are situated in, in Europe and this is how our region looks. It is actually uh, not a very easy uh, cross-border region uh, because it is long almost 600 kilometers and almost 400 of these kilometers are marked by the Danube River where we have only two road crossings here and here. So from a purely infrastructural point of view, it is uh, how to say not so easy to uh, to work to develop businesses here. Also, we have a lot of demographic challenges because we are quite close to the capitals of Bulgaria, Sofia, and Romania. 
So a lot of our young people are quite tempted to move southwards or northwards just because the conditions for career development are better there. But at the same time, uh, we have a lot of uh, precious things, which is a good history of cooperation between the, the communities, even before joining the European Union. So a lot of added values in this regard. And also we have wonderful grassroots initiatives in many small communities and regions. A lot of successful uh, projects, a lot of successful initiatives, which actually come even without projects. And this is something which we think should be valorized and moved forward. Uh, but uh, of course, the main things which we still have to, to struggle with, and this is also what we noticed, is basically the lack of good civic education culture. So not so many people know the legal paths through which they can raise their good initiatives on the, um, on the agenda of the decision makers. Uh, the second issue is, of course, as regards um, cohesion policy, is that many youth organizations consider these programs too complicated for them and sometimes don't understand the taxonomy very well. So this is something where you should also step in. Uh, so our initiative wanted to improve young people's involvement in the cohesion policy, particularly in the cross-border cooperation for Bulgaria and Romania, and also to present success stories, uh, because we have such where basically youth and civic society organizations manage to do something good and sustainable. And in the end, this will help us uh, with other programs as well. Um, and this is what we did. The first was to develop a practical outline for the mechanisms to which citizens can basically place their ideas on the decision makers agenda. And this was really important just to know in a simple way how to do it. On the second place, uh, this is how it looks. We um, uh, made these six uh, videos of success stories of uh, what basically our brave citizens and young people could do. Not all of these organizations are youth organizations, but we have a lot of young people on the teams, which is already an excellent added value. On the third place, we made an interactive step-by-step -step guide showing how cohesion policy works and especially focusing on our region for the next programming period, what our organizations can do. Lastly, we developed a mobile app for civic participation, where we basically present up-to-date information on what opportunities are open. And at the same time, we managed to establish this connection email channel with a couple of local authorities, municipalities, where anyone who is interested can directly uh, write and suggest their ideas to the uh, municipalities. All this is available freely on Google Play web app. Uh, we have Bulgarian, Romanian, and English versions. So basically, this is it. It's not substantial, but we try to focus on the main problems and uh, to provide support where we consider it is needed most. Thank you. This is it. <laughs> sure, but thank you very much indeed, uh, Svetlina. That's a, a really uh, interesting. And again, another very useful set of um, examples that people can draw upon. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. But, uh, um, if we could go back, please, now to the yes. panel. Thank you very much. Super. So um, let's just take uh, the results of the second poll before I introduce our additional panelists. So we've got poll one, but we really want to go to poll two, uh, which we've had an opportunity to vote on. Thank you, Charlotte. I know you're working away to give me poll two, which we can see now. So this was um, choosing one of these. Uh, and we can see that the, um, yes, um, right at front is boosting employment access to training and education. Uh, so that's got the most responses. Um, second to that, addressing issues most important to young people. I want to come back to that in a minute. I think that's very interesting uh, how that's done. 
the facilitating dialogue between young people and their institutions, whether they're local, national, or European Union institutions, that's, that does get a, a degree of support, and that's very interesting. And also uh, communicating better about what uh, they can do for their regions uh, gets a number of supported uh, supportive remarks. So let's uh, let's uh, let's turn to our panelists now. We've we've heard. Um, very, very well from Louise uh, and from Bekther about the manifesto. We've had two great case studies from Maria Rosaria and from Svetlina. Thank you for that. We're being joined also uh, by Benjamino uh, Brunati, who is uh, himself a former um, uh, interreg volunteer youth, uh, active in the program uh, and in many other respects. Benjamino, you're very welcome. Uh, and also we're joined by Birte Wassenberg. Uh, who is the Professor in History of International Relations at the Political Sciences Institute in the University of Strasbourg. And she has, she holds the distinguished position of the Jean Monnet Chair on the contribution of cross-border cooperation to the European neighbourhood policy. So um, if, if we get it wrong, Beata, you're the one to put us right. <laughs> no, that's so, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I wonder if I might start, because we haven't had a chance to, to hear from you and your experiences. Uh, could, we, could I start with Benjamina and Berta, perhaps Benjamina first, just, just to ask perhaps your response to some of the case studies and some things you've maybe seen through the IV programme, things you've seen of, of good examples and perhaps comment on, on some of the uh, what we've already heard, Benjamina. Yes, good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. I just wanted to make a very quick correction. I'm currently an, an Interact volunteer. Uh, oh, my experience will only be over in February, unfortunately. Um, yes, I uh, I really agree uh, mainly on two points that were uh, brought up by uh, the uh, by previous speakers. Um, I uh, well, the first thing that I uh, that comes to my mind when I think about youth involvement in uh, cross border cooperation really is the need of uh, civic education, as uh, Svetalina was mentioning. Um, and the need to, uh, to, uh, to create more awareness through education among uh, youth who are not necessarily aware of, uh, of these uh, programs, of uh, opportunities, including the, uh, the IV uh, program, and awareness among uh, public authorities as well, uh, whether that is at national, regional, local level. Uh, they see it uh, complicated, as it, as it was uh, already mentioned, uh, sometimes they lack the, uh, the capacity, despite the, uh, the, uh, the very large uh, amount of, uh, of projects and initiatives that are uh, currently running, um, but they're not necessarily uh, willing or able to, uh, to uh, promote initiatives that, uh, that uh, include uh, youth a little bit more. So uh, I think this is a, this is a great challenge for uh, for uh, the future years and the opportunity is there right now, uh, given the uh, transition period that uh, that we're living, uh, thanks to the, uh, the the new program being uh, implemented in a little bit. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Let uh, Beata, can I turn to you, um, to, perhaps to to any reflections you have on what we've heard already? But can I also, just in the broader context, uh, uh, one of the um, things that is really useful and our poll demonstrates that people think it, it can be valuable is the relationship of young people to their local, national and EU institutions. I just wondered, however, um, in your experience, and you, you study this um, and, and you will uh, see whether it happens, the difficulty sometimes is not so much with local or indeed EU institutions, it's about national institutions. The issue is uh, often the cross-border regions are literally and sometimes meta meta metaphorically peripheral to the uh, national institutions. Um, and I wondered whether that is a particular, whether there's a need for a particular focus on bringing the cross-border regional cooperation to the attention of national authorities. Yeah, what I, I would even go beyond this uh, saying that uh, what we need really is a kind of multi multi-level uh, governance approach to to the issue of cross-border cooperation and uh, when it comes to 
to even general issues, we've seen that in the crisis is that um, uh, when when rebordering took place here in, in, in my border region where I live, um, the, the population and young people included, but uh, the whole population was not really well informed about the measures taken and there was no link between the local and the national level. Uh, there, there were better links between local and Euro European levels than with the, uh, a coordination uh, with uh, of cross-border governance structures. And uh, that has been improved, uh, but there is a real need for this. And the national level does uh, pose difficulties. And in some um, uh, member states, there's still also a kind of fear uh, when you uh, when you uh, are um, when local uh, on a local level you you try to what I call practice foreign policy with your neighbors without um, uh, without informing or being controlled by the national level not in all uh, member states of the European Union but in some yes yeah very good um, I wonder if I could just turn back to our two um, case studies. Um, I think uh, Zvetalina, you, in particular, because you quite rightly uh, referred to the importance of borders are often characterized by natural features, in your case, the river. Um, um, but also, Maria Rosario, very, very often, I mean, you have the most beautiful region, but of course, it has some um, significant physical issues in terms of um, you know, mountains and certain valleys connect up, and connectivity is, can be tricky. But I just wondered whether. Um, you found through the through young people's interest, not least in the environment, that actually you can turn the fact of these uh, um, natural features, which are tremendously important in the topography of the region, you can turn them into something that young people feel they can take a shared responsibility for. So the you know the quality of the river and the the environment of of the Danube or you know, the, the, the environmental importance of the Alps. Have you found that young people on uh, both sides of the border really can take a shared interest in those environmental um, characters? Um, Svetlina, did, did, have you found that? Yes, in fact, in our case, it is exactly as you, as you say, Andrew, this is absolutely correct. So uh, the first civic initiatives among youth, but also in general, because you are in a member state, you know, and uh, our history is a bit different. The first initiatives were the environmental issues. So people focused on the resources which we share. And there we have really a lot of, of good knowledge, a lot of really wonderful initiatives. And this, uh, this actually continues. So this, this has been a very, very good starting point. And in view of the new priorities, this is really important. So this is something which needs to be valorized because on the other part, uh, if we make this bridge with, especially with the local authorities, actually it is, I absolutely agree that uh, it is actually much easier to work with the local authorities and local communities at the regional level than with the national uh, with the level. Uh, but at the same time, um, when the region has a lot of other problem, problems, sometimes the local authorities focus on the most, how to say, on the most immediate issues, on the most pressing ones. And sometimes uh, the others which are considered not so important are left behind. So we need to be more active and we need to work more actively with the local authorities just to place our things high on, on their priorities. Right, very good, very interesting. Um, Maria Rosaria, um, obviously, have you found, uh, you, you mentioned during the course of your presentation about young people taking an interest in environmental issues. Yeah. Have you found that in your, in your program that they have particularly taken an interest in the, uh, in the environment of the Alps? Yeah, of course, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, environment is one of uh, the topic uh, that uh, take, uh, takes a more place in uh, our programmation. And uh, it's a topic uh, that is uh, very, very interesting for young people uh, who are approaching uh, to the program. Uh, our audience, as well as uh, the, the local uh, local people, the AV, uh, and uh, the program uh, worked a lot on this topic uh, for the previous uh, program period, um, even in our communication uh, than uh, in our project. And uh, 
surely um, with the result of the consultation is one on the topic that will remain and will be empowered uh, uh, in the new program period uh, because um, all the young people uh, uh, are uh, very aware about the climate change and our area is very affected about it um, so it's um, surely one of the topic on which we will work uh, with the young people as well that are really really engaged on this very interesting. Thank you very much. Can I remind uh, all of our participants, please use the Q&A to put questions uh, to the panellists. We, we have one at the moment. Can I come to, um, uh, to you, Beata, a question um, re referencing what Benjamino and Svetlina have already been saying about the importance of access to education opportunities. Um, but asking you in particular, you've been working on the uh, MOOC on territorial cooperation. Do you think, uh, the question is, do you uh, see this online education course addressing the knowledge gaps and bringing, and can you bring that closer? Can that bring uh, the, that service closer to young people in border regions? Yeah, I mean, definitely, it's it's not only for the young people, it's even for us as the board, uh, board of researchers, we're, it's it's a formidable experience that we are living through because uh, uh, the online teaching, we are, you know, we are a little bit more on the classical teaching front uh, still uh, in the university. So I think it's an excellent tool and it is a new tool. And it also, we are preparing different, um, uh, it's a different methodology to, to teaching. So uh, uh, we, we have been conducting interviews with stakeholders with young people as well and we are uh, we are producing short videos we are uh, we are thinking of uh, learning material so um, uh, and and that uh, with a, an overall European perspective and I must say also the MOOC is not is is for students but we have also uh, the ambition to open it up to actors uh, of cross-border cooperation. And so uh, we have associated um, uh, some um, institutions for this, the Mission Operationnelle Transfrontalière, the Euro Institute in Kiel and the SESCI. And so this kind of brings together actors or institutions represented actors of territorial cooperation, uh, the European Commission and us researchers, uh, all for the benefit of, of, of young people and 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 I, I mean we still have to see what it's going to to how it's going to work out we have a testing session as you know in in March and uh, uh, so we are still it's still work in progress but I must admit on a personal uh, um, note uh, for me it's it's an absolutely a great experience uh, uh, already uh, trying to put up this uh, this MOOC on territorial cooperation yes oh, that's very interesting thank you very much yeah uh, um, Svetlina, I just wonder if I could um, just come come back to you with a question on the okay. Q&A. Um, it's about the mobile app on civic participation, which I think you referred mm -hmm. to. Would you mind just perhaps um, telling us a bit more about that, about utilisation, uh, mm -hmm. who uses it, how they use it, uh, what the opportunities are for its use? Oh, basically it is, uh, as I mentioned, it is uh, on... Uh, on Google Apps, it is uh, freely downloadable. You just uh, type uh, Roblox. Uh, and uh, there we present in a very concise form uh, all these um, guidelines, which we already developed. Uh, it is suitable for offline use it's, uh, as well, adapted for small screen reading and all these uh, tools. Maybe the only thing which uh, is in a way how to say um, specific is that it is particularly targeting the opportunities for the cross-border region between Bulgaria and, and Romania. So the information is focused on this, but still in the materials, some other how to say ideas and hints for the other programs can be found. And also the, the last functionality, which I mentioned is uh, this uh, email linkage and uh, chains uh, to uh, basically write directly to the uh, municipalities. Basically we uh, contacted a lot of local authorities just requesting the contacts of the persons who are uh, devising the policies programs and so on. So basically anyone who is interested can directly write there and be sure that uh, 
the message reaches the, the right person in the administration. So shortly, this is it. It is comparatively new, I might say, because the full version was launched end of November, beginning of December, something like this. Uh, technically, we needed, I think, about a month. Uh, to have it approved on uh, by the Google app. It is also available, I think, for <laughs> online news, sorry, through our uh, website, and this is it. Uh, lastly, what I can share is experience. Actually, the contribution on behalf of the local authorities was really important for us, but the practice is that we had, how to say, more enthusiasm on behalf of the small municipalities and small lo local authorities than on behalf of the larger ones. But I think this is logical. Maybe it happens everywhere. Very good, very interesting. Um, Benjamino, I wonder if I could come to you. The, the, the second poll put the most, the greatest importance on the um, uh, exchanges, the cross-border exchanges, particularly for students, young people from schools and universities and so on, and the twinning programs. I'm not sure what the balance is between those, but certainly from, from your experience, um, how, how well do, uh, um, schools and universities either side of the border respond to these opportunities and are there particular things which maybe encourage them to participate? Um, yes, I remember when I was in high school there were some opportunities of this kind that were not uh, directly uh, targeted at cross-border cooperation, but there were uh, twinning programs within uh, the EU. I didn't personally take part in that, but I know it's opportunities that exist. I think the, uh, the challenge now is really to uh, mainstream them, to uh, make them more uh, uh, systematic, to, uh, to increase the amount of, uh, of young Europeans who have, uh, who have access to that. Um, and I think a big role, this was mentioned before uh, uh, as well, is really uh, in uh, is really uh, the, uh, to the class of uh, civic education. So uh, it's uh, the bigger picture is civic education has the potential to uh, create awareness about European citizenship, European uh, uh, the European sphere, the European Union more in general, and this applies to European cross border cooperation as well. Um, I believe so. This could be more of a theoric class uh, kind of uh, um, arrangement, but also uh, something more practical, something more related to uh, experiences, personal experiences for uh, more and more Europeans. So uh, uh, I think, I, I mean, a dream of uh, of uh, having uh, well, I dreamed because uh, I'm not a student anymore, but I dreamed of having uh, classes about. Uh, European uh, policies about European uh, cooperation in school than in university. I know that exists, but it's not as uh, wide reaching as uh, as it could be, I believe. Yeah, yeah. But it, yeah, uh, very good. Thank you very much for that. Um, there's a, um, I just wondered, Louise, from the point of view of, uh, uh, you know, that being the most important thing, there are some tools that are available in addition to the um, interreg uh, volunteer youth, which we've heard about things like Erasmus and so on. Have you, um, have you, have you seen other tools for um, educational exchange and cooperation being used in this context well? Um, I, I think that uh, as always, we are always trying to, to create synergies and cooperation across the commission initiatives as well. Um, I, I think that there are a lot of um, new initiatives coming with the new Erasmus Plus. Um, so I think that this is definitely something to to keep an eye out for. Um, I, I have to say I'm not that familiar with the new Erasmus Plus program, but I know that there are a lot of new opportunities. And I mean, I know that there are also a lot of new opportunities for volunteering, for example, and uh, for exchanges, um, also for um, people in, in vocational trainings, for example, uh, relating also to the, one of the questions that I saw in the Q&A about involving people that may be uh, a bit longer, uh, not so involved in the cross-border uh, cooperation, but also creating opportunities for them to come out and to have these exchanges and these experiences. So I think that there, the focus is also to, to include um, um, all types of, of young people uh, in that yeah, sense in these yeah, exchanges. Absolutely. But you're right, Erasmus Plus might have additional opportunities, uh, that's right. 
But um, I think we we had a we had a good question. I think from Victoria, which yes. perhaps if I could take to you, Maria Rosaria, because um, obviously um, we want to make sure that young people are every kind every every young person gets an opportunity to take part. So I wondered if you could just say a bit about perhaps the involvement of the demographic makeup of those who are involved in the cross border activities. So. Uh, we don't want it limited just to those who maybe have language skills or have higher education interests. We want it to be something which reaches to every young person. And I wondered if you uh, ha had an occasion in your case study in, in, in Alcultra to, to particularly to reach out perhaps to some of those uh, who have not previously been involved and what are some of the mechanisms for that? Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> Usually, uh, uh, we have already people uh, that uh, are um, um, friendly <laughs> with the mobility. Uh, it's the reality uh, uh, because uh, uh, they know already a bit uh, the two languages. Um, we had the different level uh, of uh, language uh, languages skill. Uh, actually, so um, we have had uh, volunteers with a very good level of both the languages and the people uh, who didn't know one of the two uh, program languages. Uh, so actually, we had uh, the experience of both that uh, changed completely the way to work with the volunteer as well, because the program as the Italian and the French as a program languages. So if the interreg reporter have to work, has to work in communication, of course, he or she needs to know the two languages of the program. If not, it's really difficult for the person. But um, it's not a point that completely can exclude uh, a younger people uh, who doesn't speak one of the two languages as well. After uh, actually is the role of the mentor to help uh, these uh, young people to develop new skills as well. Um, for me, it's a balance uh, between uh, giving and receiving. Uh, uh, the fact that these people, uh, that, uh, this person uh, doesn't speak one of the two languages, it's uh, don't avoid to uh, uh, receive something uh, to, to him or her in the communication work of the program. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, I just wondered, um, Bekta, can I, can I turn to you? The um, question about um, the kind of mechanisms one can use to promote cross-border cooperation amongst young people and, and uh, obviously we've focused on education. There is employment and training, which is very important, which has appeared um, prominently in our responses. Um, but I was wondering more widely, things like sport and art and creativity and so on. Many of these, of course, can, particularly where sport and art is concerned, can involve different sets of young people. And some of the issues we have to tackle, like connectivity and uh, languages, um, we can we can overcome some of those and, and bring uh, young people together. Have you found that there's a lot of interest in trying to do cross-border work in arts and sports and creative industries? Yes, actually, um, I can testify from my own experience. I grew up in Strasbourg, so near a border region, and um, very young, actually. In, so I grew up looking at the EU at crossing the border. I never thought the border as a physical obstacle. It was more maybe about how to reach out to the other side, how to actually connect with other people that are not necessarily speaking the same language, but very young uh, through school, through school and through very scholar activity, I got to actually meet other, other people from another country. And I never got to, act, to feel that it was another country because that was the same area than, than mine. That's just like the extension, it's a bridge. It's not very much a, 
a border anymore. And um, even now growing up, I do not live in a border region anymore. I still, I'm still very involved into border regions. But as I was traveling and meeting people, I realized that a lot of people, we, we are a generation uh, that did not experience the internal EU border as a passing, a physical passing. We, we have another perspective on that. For us, or I will speak for myself maybe, um, it's more about connecting each other, finding a way to actually pinpoint our common common points, common areas. And uh, I, I have been these last few months going a lot around Europe and meeting a lot of younger people. And they're in, interested in mobility, in getting involved in changing and changing what is happening in their areas, local areas, but also getting involved in what is being decided now because everything that is being decided now is what we're going to live through our lives and yeah, yeah. we are the ones that know best what are our challenges but I also see I also notice something a lot of people do not know about Interreg they do not know about cross-border cooperation they know Schengen we are all a lot of Schengen babies so we don't we 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 know that we can travel that we have a lot of facilities that this is due to eu policies but we don't know about the opportunities that we have to get involved and it's kind of a bubble like in this bubble of transborder cooperation a lot of people know each other we know the programs and the the difficulty is how do we involve younger people that do not share this background, that do have different interests than just political or administrative. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's also by opening this project calls to younger people with a diversity of subjects and not only focused on a more public administration aspect of it. And that's also part of environment, art and sport. Yeah. Um while, while you have the floor, um, uh, uh, Baxter, would you, is there any more um, that people would want to know about the uh, Interreg Youth Summit in May that you referred to? Um, it, will you be able to, will people be able to tap into that information through the Focal Point Network? Uh, yes, so now with the, uh, the group, the, we are preparing this uh, submit that will uh, happen in Tirana that is this year youth capital mm -hmm. so we are planning a, a conference with workshops uh, to talk about the different opportunities uh, available for youth to cooperate in transborder projects but we also would like to have panels with people involved in interact programs and youth to create a link in discussing together what are the the issues that young people face and what what kind of involvement they want. Uh, for now, it's still in preparation. Uh, we do have contact with the DG Regio and the IBBR and USR, and obviously the border focal point. And we will keep you updated about all what was going to happen. Super, thank you very much. Uh, Beata, can I just turn to you? Uh, I've actually got two questions. What, on our Q&A, we've got a question about from Natalie um, asking about the teaching of history and uh, across the European Union. And could curricula specifically include common history of border regions? Is it flexible enough to do that? And I wonder, I while, you, while you have the floor, um, we, we, we talked for an hour and you know what? We have not talked about COVID or the pandemic. But um, I just wondered whether maybe um, you might tell us to what extent have the um, have the, have the consequences of the pandemic in terms of um, inability for movement, inability to have gatherings, inability to um, uh, for people to uh, get together in the way that they would want to do uh, for employment training, all sorts of rules and so on. Is that really can we can we confidently regard that as a temporary phenomenon and something that we can move beyond rapidly, or is it? Has it, has it perhaps, particularly where young people are concerned, had some 
uh, long-term consequences. So sorry, I've given you two questions and we've, we've got about five uh, minutes. That now, doesn't so. matter. Th thanks, uh, uh, Natalie, for the question, Trusted, to ask me a question like this, <laughs> um, it's um, which I could ask, uh, talk about for hours, of course, because I'm a historian. But uh, first of all, teaching history, um, uh, because she's talking about common curricula um, on a European level, extremely difficult. And um, uh, so uh, for at the moment, the Council of Europe has, again, uh, a working group on this subject to you know, kind of find a way to to approach uh, European history on a common basis and then put it in the curricula in the schools is a second uh, challenge. We have uh, had the experience between France and Germany of a Franco-German um, history book, but uh, the success of this has been also limited due to the way how teaching is organized in both states. And now I have just obtained from the European Commission a new share on uh, history and, uh, and uh, the narratives of history in European integration and how you use this, uh, at least in the university. So at, at my uh, uh, level, uh, modest level, here in, at Sciences Po, I'm trying to put into place a, a new offer of teaching uh, on cross-border cooperation. Uh, and I have also um, uh, the idea to um, produce a, a manual uh, on the subject of borders European integration and um, uh, put into this uh, manual uh, um, uh, uh, an approach uh, to the history uh, of cross border cooperation, which is also extremely difficult because we have, in fact, a puzzle of numerous uh, small histories that we have to then put together with the process of European integration. And uh, that's very challenging. But I have um, taken on this challenge. So in three years' time, we might at least have a, uh, a book on this, uh, whether it will be used in a school curricula is, a, is another, a, a, another problem. We'll have to see about this. I think this is really would be a, a necessary and very, very useful. Um, as for COVID, and I was going to react when uh, Bechtel told, told me that she was in, living in Strasbourg. I'm also living between Strasbourg and Kiel, and I'm actually a borderlander. I live in Kiel, work in Strasbourg, and we were all traumatized in, uh, in, in, in spring 2020 by the rebordering. So the Schengen uh, was finished for uh, only a few months, but it was sufficient to put a big question mark on the um, resilience of cross-border um, uh, regions. And um, uh, I would, I mean, we are currently working on this subject at a European level, but research of what are the consequences of COVID on cross-border cooperation uh, in general, also for young people, of course, and for the population we have so far identified two opposed consequences. The first was a negative one on, um, on the resurgence also of ressentiment against border lenders. So it's not uh, just about employment possibilities or um, it, it was, it's just about a reversal of the European uh, uh, process of reconciliation. But then we had a second consequence, which we also identified in this border region, also the Polish-Danish uh, Polish uh, uh, German border region and uh, to some extent in the Danish German border region was that uh, after uh, reactions of ressentiment, we also had a uh, reaffirmation of the young people uh, calling for a reopening of borders and calling for, and uh, they say exactly what you just said, uh, that they are used, we are used, we are a generation, we have known a Europe without borders and we, we, we want to keep this Europe without borders. And so it's for the politicians and for the uh, uh, for on local, national and European level to make sure uh, that rebordering in, in what took place in, uh, is, is not going to happen again. So I have a, a lot of confidence uh, that if, in fact the long-term consequences of the COVID crisis will indeed be positive in terms of further integration and in terms also of of the affiliation of, of the of, of the young people towards the European idea and the and the idea of cross-border cooperation. That's great. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. Thank you very much, Greta. Uh, and uh, we've come to the point where I um, will uh, want to thank uh, all of our presenters. Um, thank you very much, Beth, for, um, and we. We'll, uh, I'm sure it'll be a, a great success in Tirana in May. I'm sure everyone will look forward to, to hearing about that. Um, thank you to our two case studies, to Maria Rosaria and Svetlina. And uh, I know your projects will go from strength to strength. And thank you to our two additional panelists, Benjamino, to give us your personal experience as a, uh, an Ivy volunteer, and Beata, thank you, not, not least for the historical perspective. Thank you to the audience as well. And I'm going to pass uh, just to, to, to mention, um, in addition to the questions, thank you for those. We've also had a really good chat going on. Um, and I know many of you will want to just, just check the chat that you've picked up 
some of those really useful links that people have been making and the points that people have been putting up on the chat, which have been really interesting too. Um, but I do want to give Louise an opportunity to reflect on some of the points that have been made and perhaps add uh, any of her own before we close uh, our uh, borders breakfast this morning. Louise, please. Thank you so much, Andrew. I will keep it short. Uh, first of all, I also thought it was lovely to just have a, a little over an hour to just talk about, uh, you know, interesting examples and about the future rather than, than COVID, even if it's important to discuss the effects, of course. But um, well, this was just lovely to listen to. Um, we have heard from a number of different actors today um, and also very practical examples, some of them that I wasn't so much familiar with. Uh, so I learned a lot uh, about how different, how, how we can work with youth in a different and in innovative ways uh, through the Interreg programs. Um, I take note also from the polls that you consider it's almost as important uh, to work with issues that are important to young people, such as climate issues as it is to work with education and training opportunities. Um, and this shows that we need to bring in youth to know what their priorities are. Uh, we have the youth manifesto, of course, but it can, of course, vary between different um, border regions, as we heard uh, uh, from one of the speakers, that they had some specific issues in their region that uh, the youth were particularly concerned with. Um, and that makes it, of course, very important also to reach out and to inform young people and trying to bring them in um, and also to create opportunities for young people, for example, by introducing micro projects, a very interesting example, and I'm very interested in, in uh, knowing about the results here in the future. Um, so just short messages to programs. Uh, we, we hope that you will be, you, you will work with this and uh, how to involve youth actively in the programs in a way that makes sense in your border, of course, and the European Year Youth could be an occasion to kick off this youth engagement and to take inspiration of what we heard today. Uh, another way could be to involve a, a volunteer in your program, an Ivy volunteer. Uh, or also to encourage uh, the project to involve a, uh, a young person as a volunteer. Uh, and please use the Youth for Cooperation uh, stamp for your projects and events, and also the hashtag that you see up here. Um, uh, and also please add your youth projects or events also on the GGA at Youth Portal. I will try to put uh, the link in the chat if it's not already there, because um, uh, this would give more visibility to interreg projects also Europe-wide and Commission-wide. Uh, and message to the youth, I mean, many of you are already engaged in different ways, but you're of course welcome to engage in our youth core group if you're not already there, where we exchange experience between the Commission services and, and the youth engaged. Um, and we think that this is also a good way to create new partnerships and find synergies, uh, which we've already seen with this new uh, Interreg Youth event coming up, uh, which I'm very much looking forward to. Um, Yes, and, and that's it. Um, I think that the European Year Youth is a momentum to make your voice heard, and this is a really good kickoff, and I leave this meeting with a really good feeling about this. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much indeed, Louise, and thank you to all that you and your colleagues are doing at DG Regio to enable the Border Focal Point Network really to be a great success. Uh, I know we'll all follow up on, on all of these ideas, um, but also I'm looking forward to a further uh, borders breakfast debate, but uh, I think details will be posted uh, about that, but we're hoping there'll be another debate in March. Uh, they, they do relate to one another. The, the last one on transport was really interesting. And of course, that connectivity and transport is really important from the point of view of uh, young people's getting together in cross-border regions as well. So they, they all link together and make a really um, effective opportunity for people in cross-border cooperation to learn from others and to implement great ideas themselves. Thank you all very much for all of your participations this morning. Thanks once again to all our participants and our panelists. Uh, have a very good day, and we look forward to seeing you again, perhaps at the seventh Borders Breakfast Debate in March. Thank you very much indeed, and have a great day. Bye now. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.